Okay, so we're going to continue with our series, um, Act 1, The Setup. Um, I'm just going to give a quick review. So on our timeline, we're going through the Old Testament, and we're telling the story um, of the, whole, the Old Testament. And, and in Genesis 1, we find that God created the heavens and the earth, and all that was in the earth, he created man in his own image and gave man a, um, a, a commandment to multiply and to fill the earth and also to subdue the earth. So man was given this job of um, tending the earth and, and subduing the earth, and it was a picture of man ruling um, in, the, you know, in the domain that God had given him to rule in. And he gave him this instruction, do not eat from just, you can eat from every tree, but not from this one tree, which is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And we see that when they ate the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that they were um, all of a sudden self-aware because now they knew good from evil. And before they just had fellowship with God. So they, they were separated um, and but we see that God puts them out of the garden, not because God is a cruel God, but he puts them out of the garden because he knew that in the garden they would live forever in the state of knowing good and evil, and he did not want that for them. That would be torture. There's something, we're all afraid of death, but there's some finality that death brings that, that puts us out of this misery, and we are with God the Father, and there's comfort in knowing that we will be with him in fullness. So he puts them out of the garden. Um, that was the fall of man. And then Adam and Eve began to reproduce, have children. They had Cain and Abel. And we see that there was tension between these two men. All through the Old Testament, you will see shadows and types, types and shadows that point to something else. And the whole Old Testament, we see this pointing of the coming of Jesus. Um, and we'll see that in all of the stories that we, that we go through. But Cain and Abel, one brought an offering that was pleasing to God, one brought an offering that was not pleasing to God. And he rejected Cain's offering, but received Abel's offering. Does anybody remember why? Or what, what was it about Cain's offering that he brought? Yeah, he was taking a shortcut. It was the fruit of his own hands. It was kind of like the leftovers. He brought some of his produce, if you want to put it in common you know, vocabulary. But Abel brought like the first, like the prime animal and gave it to God. And so Cain... Um, gets very jealous of Abel. He murders his brother, and God s tells him, confronts him on his attitude, on his heart. It was really about a heart issue. And so we see these two brothers, and things aren't good. Cain, even at the end, when Cain is like, please don't put me away, pl you know, God's like, I'm going to care for you, even though you are now separated from me. So we see this, this, care of God, the care of God all throughout, even when these people disobey and rebel against God. So then more people are on the earth. The earth becomes very evil, and, and God has this remorse that he actually made mankind because there's so much evil on the earth. And so he picks Noah, and he says, Noah is a righteous man, and, and he tells Noah, I want you to preach for 120 years about the coming flood and coming destruction if, if people don't repent. So for 120 years, Noah is preaching the righteousness of God and asking people to turn from their wicked ways. And it was very, very evil on the earth. We talked a little bit about some of the evil that existed. Um, and so the people do not repent. And so God sends, you know, gives Noah instructions to build the ark he puts Noah and all of his family and two of every kind of animal, female and male, into the ark, into the huge, huge boat. And it rains for 30 days and 40 days. 
Um, and, and I think also like the water they had never seen, the, it's like the fountains of the earth were broke open. And so water came up and water came down. And Noah was in the ark, um, probably terrified, I would imagine. Um, and then Noah sends out the doves to find out is there water, you know, is there dry land. Three doves went out. When he sent the last dove out, it did not return. And so he knew the dove had found rest on the, on the land. So Noah comes out of the ark and all of his family and all of the animals. And God, Sarah talked about this last week, God gives Noah the same commandment that he gives, that he gave Adam when he said, multiply um, and fill the earth and subdue the earth. It's in um, Genesis chapter, I think that's in Genesis chapter 9. He says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And he puts fear of animals, the fear, he puts fear into the animals, fear of man, so that the animals will stay away from man. And um, so Noah comes out, and Noah had three sons, Ham, Japheth, and Shem. And, at, and when he comes out of the, the boat, God makes a covenant to, um, to Noah saying that he would never destroy the earth again by flood. And so he gives the rainbow as his sign that he's made this covenant with Noah. So now we come to Genesis chapter 11, and this section of scripture is called the Tower of Babel. And um, Alex drew a very large tower over there representing the Tower of Babel. So Noah comes, we're in, uh, I'm going to just read you real fast in, because it's important for you to know this character named Nimrod. So in Genesis 10, 8 through 10, he's going over the descendants of Noah, and it says, now Cush became the father of Nimrod, <clears throat> and he became a mighty one on earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. That word before the Lord means um, in defiance of. So Ham was the one, remember, that he didn't cover his father's nakedness. And, and so Noah says to Ham, you, you will serve your younger brother. Um, and so Ham is the father of Cush. Cush is the father of Nimrod, and Nimrod was a very rebellious man and in defiance of the Lord. Um, so in the translation into the Aramic language, um, which is what they used in, in Christ's day, the Jerusalem Targum says this, that he, Nimrod, was powerful in hunting and wickedness before the Lord, for he was a hunter of the sons of men. And he said unto them, Depart from the judgment of the Lord, and adhere to the judgment of Nimrod. Therefore it is said, As Nimrod is the strong one, strong in hunting and in wickedness before the Lord. So Nimrod rebelled. He was a rebeller of things of God. And he tried to get the people to also rebel with him. And he was a very violent man. He didn't just hunt animals. He, he was a murderer. And so Nimrod came from the line of Ham. Shem, eventually from Shem's line will come Abraham, and through Abraham's line will come the promised Messiah. Okay, so here again we see, we see the difference in the contrast between two. Cain and Abel, um, Nimrod and Shem. I mean, we see this, this comparison, this good and evil, this common theme in Scripture where man tries to determine his own path and man tries to become his own God. Okay, so this is a common theme that we see in Scripture. Now we're going to read Genesis 11, 1 through 9. Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words because everyone was from the same family. So, of course, they had one language. It came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. 
They said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. They said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. The Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all the same language, and that, and this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and therefore confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. So this is the Tower of Babel. Um, first, they were told to multiply and fill the earth, okay? God did not want them to stay in this one little area, but man's heart was, let's stay and build this tower. We'll reach all the way to the heavens, and if you really start studying that, um, I've talked about the book of Jasher. The J book of Jasher gives a little more historical detail around that, but the thought was, we'll reach the heavens and put our gods there in, in, in that place. Um, it was a, a rebellion against God, and Nimrod was at the heart of this. He was, he was kind of the king of the earth at that time. Do you, do you ever wonder what happened to the garments that God provided for Adam? So, Again, this is like not in scripture. It's just history according to Josephus and some other. Um, but the, the garments were passed down to, you know, like we would give Wesley's mother and father gave her silver. And so these garments were passed down from one generation to the next. And they ended up being given to Noah eventually. And Ham stole them from Noah we don't know for sure when, but he gave them to Cush, and Nimrod had these these garments. So, and he he was this rebel on the earth, and he was kind of the leader of this whole movement um, of building the the Tower of Babel, um, because it was in his heart to be God, be his own God. Um, so here we come. We have this this tower that's being built, they're all, they, just by the sheer fact that they want to stay together and not separate, um, it's like they wanted to build their own civilization without God. They were already disobeying God because God wanted them to scatter over the earth and fill the earth. And, um, but they wanted to kind of build their own empire. And I just had this thought, and I want to throw it out there to you, I think even as a church, as we look at our church, sometimes we can have this, like, we want to stay just who we are. We want to be, you know, we don't want it to grow. We don't want it to move beyond this little circle. And there can be a good heart behind that. But everything that is, that has life is meant to reproduce, Everything, a living organism will die if it does not grow. It must give birth to something. So I just, you know, I say that to us as a caution to, to not think about wanting to stay this, in this little huddle, but, but that we are living, breathing organisms of God that are meant to, to grow something, to birth something, to to, it's, it's not supposed to stay all like our little empire. That's, that's not healthy. And, and so in scripture here, we see that they had this mentality, we're going we're gonna to do this thing for ourselves and become our own 
um, our own masters, and we're going we're gonna to make a name for ourselves. Okay, so this area that, that was known as Babel it later becomes the, um, the city of Babylon. You all are familiar with that. Okay, and, and it eventually becomes this empire, the Babylonian Empire, and the Babylonian Empire is the one that took, took Judah into captivity, do you remember? And they were, in Babylon, they were in the Babylon captivity for years because of their own rebellion. So here is a type for you. In Scripture, Babylon is a type for world thinking, World, a worldly mentality. Okay, so Babylon in Scripture doesn't just represent a location. It also represents a mentality. Okay, so the, the mentality of Babylon. And we're going to see it here in Scripture because it is a type, and it's some, there's something we can learn from this. Okay, so they wanted to make a, known, make a name for themselves. They wanted to... Uh, build this city and civilization without, without um, God. All right, so go to Isaiah chapter 47. And I'm just going to read a few verses that very much describes the mentality of Babylon. This is right before they are taken into captivity by Bab- the Babylonian captivity. God says to them, verse 8, Now then, hear this, you sensual one who dwells securely, who says in your heart, I am, and there is no one besides me. I will not sit as a widow nor no loss of children, but these two things will come on you suddenly in one day, loss of children and widowhood. They will come on you in full measure in spite of your many sorcerers and in spite of your great power, the great power of your spells. You felt secure in your wickedness and said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge, they have deluded you. For you have said in your heart, I am and there is no one besides me. This is a great description of the Babylonian mentality. It's all about, and this is what we see all through Scripture, it's all about me. It's all about what I want. It's all about, it's about me. And who else is there? There is no one besides me. And this is like very much the mentality of Babylon. You see it all the way back at the Tower of Babel where they are like, let's make a name for ourselves. Let's make us known. It's all about what we want. This Tower of Babel, this Babylon Babylon mentality, it runs through the the world's influence. It is the influence of modern worldly thinking. And God set it up from the beginning that it's his creation. I don't know where we get this idea that we can be our own gods. Because God created the earth, God created man, and God put man in the earth and and said, now, follow me. And do it. It's like if I make a a machine that is going to do awesome, wonderful things on the earth. I create it. I thought of it. I made it. I put it on the earth, and I say to everyone, "Come, let me teach you about this machine. I'm going to show you how it runs and how it works." And it's like if we, if you all come and say about my machine, no, I will determine how this machine works. I will decide how this machine operates. I will be the one. You just sit down. This is his creation. 
This is his creation. This is his world. You're invited and have been placed into it. And as we heard from testimonies, it's not because God is on a power trip. He knows how it works. He knows how it works. And he knows when we rebel and go our own way and have Babylon mentality that I am and there is no one besides me. He knows you're heading for a disaster because I actually know how this all is supposed to work. And so the way it works is when Addison says, "Ah, I can't run anymore. He is better for me. I am actually happier when I surrender to him. I am actually loved and cared for when I surrender to him. But when I step away and rebel, and I'm, thank you very much, God, but I'm going to be my own God and do it my own way, and I know better because I am and there is no one besides me. Disaster comes because he made the rules. But he, he made the rules because he loves us. He does not tell us these things to punish us or to hurt us. It's actually to bring us into that place of sweet fellowship. And he pursues us. And he cares for us even when we rebel against him. So he sees this and he's like, no, no. Because man, you're actually very powerful people. Because guess what? You're made in my image. So my plan is what will be on the earth, one way or the other. And so he comes down and he's like, we're gonna mess their language up. They are not gonna build this tower. Turn to Psalm 2. Psalm 2. It says, why are the nations in an uproar and these people devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their feathers apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavenly in the heavens laugh. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, his holy mountain. He's talking about Jesus. Listen, Jesus is the one who gets the right to rule and reign. It says in verse 7, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord, He said to me, this is God speaking to Jesus, what he says about his son Jesus. You are my son, and today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with the rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now, therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, Jesus, that he not become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. He is the king He is the one who has been given the right to become king because he died on a cross. And his father, his father set him up to receive the nations as his inheritance. 
And so there's a sermon by Beth Moore called A Drunkenness Has Befallen Us, and I recommend you Google it and listen to it. It's, I'm going to quote a few things that she says in that sermon. And she's talking about this whole Babylon mentality, and, and she says these things. Satan always bets on our own self-interest. He will always place a bet on our own self-interest. He knows man is really thinking about man. He knows man is all about himself. And he will place a bet on that every time. So in the story, in God's story, we have characters. And we have good and we have evil. We have good, the the men who surrender to God and good things come. And provision and love and care and all of that. And then we have those who rebel against God and calamity comes, and then we have the enemy who is always there saying, yeah, look out for yourself. We see it in the beginning. He says to Adam and Eve, like, to, to Eve, like, oh, if you eat this, you'll be like God, and you'll see things like God sees them, like casting doubt about who God is and reaffirming to herself, don't you want it all He's withholding something from you. And if you do it this way, you can have it all. He always bets on man's self-interest. And we have a high, high tolerance for self-interest and many times a low tolerance for God interest. Satan wants to make man think that he has a better idea than God has. He, he does not want you to know that God always, always, always has your best interest in, in mind. Always. Without fail. He wants to convince us that man is kinder to man than God is. He wants to convince us that God is not really that nice. He's really not that giving. He's not really that loving. Man can do it so much better and love better and be kinder. And it's a lie. So Babylon is a type. It's a mentality. But at the end of the day, God is is God, God will fulfill his plan on the earth. Man is not God. And I want you to turn over real quick to uh, Revelation 17 and 18. The last verse in 17, it says, the woman who you saw, John has this vision in Revelation, and It says in verse 18, he's talking about the woman that John saw. The woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. After these things, chapter 18, I saw another angel. Okay, before we go too far, I'm going to just, you can just listen to me on this part. I'm going to read the first five verses of chapter 17. So one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth commit acts of immorality, and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her, mentality, of her immorality. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abomination and of the unclean things of her immorality. And on her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. And down in 18, the woman whom you saw is a great city who reigns over the kings of the earth. 
now 18. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried out with a mighty, mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by her wealth, the wealth of her sensuality. I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive her plagues. So Babylon the Great, the influencer of man's thought, the mentality of Babylon, it's about I am and there is no other. And God says, come out of that mentality. Come out of that mentality. I want you to think like I think and to be like I am, to love like I love. And that doesn't happen when we have that mentality of I am and there is none besides me. The intoxicating power of Babylon. And they were drunk. They were intoxicated with her I amness. It's all about me. It's all about me. Everywhere I turn, there is no consideration of someone else. It's about being followed, being liked, being seen. This is so in our culture. Being seen, being liked, being noticed, being intoxicated with the, the influence of being known. Make a name for yourself. Image, image making. And there is no other. The one I am is God, Yahweh. He is the I am. And he invites us to come into relationship with him. Creatures made in his image, made in his likeness, for a, pur for a purpose, for God's purposes. God says, come. Come and be a part of my story. Be a part of the redemption on the earth. It takes surrender of our hearts to the one who created us. But we are not surrendering to one who is cruel. We surrender to one who is love and who has purpose for us. The biggest burden we carry many times is our own egos. It is a burden to self-exalt. It's heavy. We will fall and die under the weight of self-exaltation. And God says, come out of her, my people. Dave. So we're seeing <coughs> in these stories this this pattern over and over again. And I, I'll just remind you that um, as we see it, like with the fall of man and, and God sending them from the garden, and we see even in the story of Noah, like in Genesis chapter 6, and really what's happening there as he uh, brings the flood of the earth, it's to purify the generation so that the seed can come uh, from a pure generation. And we see it now in Babel as he disperses them. It's this pattern over and over and over of not only man's rebellion, but this pattern of God's mercy, you know? And so when we were worshiping earlier and we're talking about this sweet assurance I have, like I can't find that assurance in me <laughs> um, because what I see in me is to be honest, like is it okay to be honest in front of church people? Is that, is that all right? Is that, Kevin, is that okay? Yeah. All right, so if I'm just being honest, even in front of church people, like, I won't, I won't get specific, but how about this? I, I see this pattern even in my own life, don't you? As you look back ac across the years, 
of rebellion over and over. What's cool is the same pattern we're seeing is uh, not only the pattern we see in our own lives, but the pattern of God's response to that. And his response to that, I don't know about you, like his response to that to me has always been it's mercy, right? And so that's this calm assurance I have. Evan uh, and the guys are going to come. They're going to sing a couple songs for us. Let me point out, though, as they come, um, just uh, I'll be brief, but, you know, there is this type in Babylon that Joy's teaching about and that we're seeing. And then <laughs> actually it points um, to the New Testament because there's a different um, – type there that we see and in response to thinking through like this mercy of God in response to that uh, uh, we see this picture come out of the, the the book of Acts and it's the opposite picture of what was going on in Babylon right so in Acts it says you he tells the disciples you receive Jesus just before his ascension you receive this power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll sh- you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even the uttermost parts of the world. So here's this promise of Jesus as he, uh, just prior to his ascension, that um, that they're going to receive power. And he, pil- he kind of like, hey, just, just sit tight, man. Just sit tight until that happens. Like if you try to go out and accomplish this thing in your own flesh, uh, guess what? Like destruction, right? And so then we see, as we, if we flash forward over in the second chapter there, when the day of Pentecost comes, they're all together in one place. Uh, how many of you guys know that, that we can know what kind of cars the disciples drove? Huh? They drove Hondas. Yeah, because they were all in one accord, as some translations would say here. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Evan, for, for, for prompting that. Yeah. And so here they are in their Honda, and there comes from heaven this noise like a violent rushing wind. Remember we talked about that early in the story? Ruach, right? It's that same wind. This wind comes. It's the Holy Spirit. It's like the Spirit of God, and it fills the whole house where they were sitting. And um, I always wanted this to happen when I preach. And there appeared to them tongues of fire distributing themselves. It's like, how did, how did it go in South Sudan? Pretty, pretty good. We, we did not see tongues of fire separating, but it was still pretty good. I've always wanted to see verse 3 here. And then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Okay, now check this out, man. Remember, God's mercy, antithetical to what was going on in Babylon, the Spirit of God comes. And as the Spirit of God comes, it says in verse 6, the sound occurs and the crowd comes together. Okay, not, they're not being dispersed. Now this crowd comes together, and they're bewildered, each one of them, because uh, each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. It's the opposite. It's the antithetical of what was happening in Babylon or in Babel at this tower. Each, and now, instead, they, they have these different languages, but because of the Spirit of God filling the place, now they hear each one speaking in his own language. And they were amazed, it says in verse 7, and astonished, saying, why are, why are not all those who are speaking uh, Galilean? Are they all Galileans? Like, why am I understanding this? <clears throat> and so I'll just remind you, and I'll be brief. The Holy Spirit comes um, in antithetical to when we, through our own efforts, are trying to see something. He tells his disciples, sit and wait, man. Just be cool. Because the Holy Spirit's going to come. He's going to fill you with power. And, and that power, the Spirit of God, that is what will enable you. That is the thing. Hey, listen. Listen to these words. The Spirit of God in antithesis to Babylon, that is the thing that brings order to chaos. The flesh brings chaos, right? The Spirit of God brings order to chaos. That is the thing that brings unity where there's division. Antithetical to Babylon, right? There's a lot of folks out there preaching unity these days. But I'm telling you, apart from the Spirit of God, apart from the Holy Spirit, there will not be unity. But as we come together, the Spirit's here, and where there's division, there can be unity. And um, where uh, uh, it's the Spirit, as we come together, that allows us, um, allows, enables our, our purpose to be achieved. They were trying to achieve it in their own strength. It didn't work. Ultimately, guys, what we're seeing here is that when operating out of their flesh in Babel with with the Babylonian uh, picture, with that Babylonian mentality, what we see is death. I'm going to guess 
that there are enough of us or many of us around who have at points in our life tried to do something like in our own strength and by our own design and it brought death. Um, what we're seeing here in Acts, the rest of the story, as the guy used to say on the radio, the rest of the story is that when the Holy Spirit comes, what has been put to death or where there's death, he brings life. And so Evan, these guys are going to sing a couple songs. I just think tonight would be a good time for us today. It would be a good time for us to pray, asking the Holy Spirit, uh, Holy Spirit, if there's something in you where there's death, it's like, Holy Spirit, bring, bring, come and bring back to, bring, bring me, bring my spirit back to life. And as you fill me, Father, with your spirit, uh, let there be unity where there has been division. And as you uh, fill me with your, with your spirit, Lord, let, let there be order where there was chaos. And as you fill me with your spirit, Father, like uh, enable me to achieve not my purposes, but your purposes. So let me ask you to stand as we, um, as we, as we close. Evan's going to play a couple songs. Hey guys, there's going to be a couple people right over here by the sound play. You know, by the sound. I want to say booth, but it's not really a booth. By the sound. Con, by the yeah, by the video room or the whatever that is. <laughs> sound table. That's it. There's going to be a couple people over by the sound table. I see Bill back there, and I see Zach, and there'll be a couple others. And, and, like, maybe there's uh, something going on in you where it's like, I just need some people to pray that the Holy Spirit would fill me and bring life where there's death. And the Holy Spirit would fill me and, and bring chaos, uh, bring uh, purpose where there's chaos. And uh, feel free to kind of move that way and have those guys pray for you. Um, or feel free just to pray even in your own seat. And um, we'll do that and then move on to a time of communion. Okay? Go ahead, Evan.